Welcome to the Ralston College podcast. I'm Stephen Blackwood. Today, my guest is the Scottish sculptor Alexander Stoddart. Stoddart is the Queen's Sculptor in Ordinary in Scotland and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. You can find images of some of Stoddart's sculptures easily online. Timeless stone figures of David Hume, Adam Smith, William Henry Playfair, and John Witherspoon. Stoddart is a very, very great artist, a polymath, and an incandescent personality. There is, frankly, a Leonardo da Vinci quality about this man. He sculpts, he draws, he paints, he writes, he composes glorious Baroque music, and when he talks, there's a sense you are with the muse, albeit amused with a hilariously irreverent sense of humor. He also has a deep sense for life's finitude, its difficulty and pain. His sense of the beautiful, his sense of human experience is shot through with that. When I visited him in Paisley, we stayed up late talking about suffering and beauty, about the finite and infinite, warmed against the cold and rainy Scottish night by the fire in his kitchen and the whiskey in our glass. I felt then that this man is a mediator, a hierarch, whose gifts, though they are, I am sure, not easy to bear, allow us to see in this broken, finite world the infinite whole that is its principle and ours. I'm Stephen Blackwood. Thanks for listening. I'm sitting here in the studio of Sandy Stoddart in Paisley, Scotland, surrounded by busts and human shapes in various forms of all kinds of sizes. It's just the kind of place you think of when you imagine an artist's studio. Sandy, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you. you for having me in. Thanks for coming. You know, there's a, there's a lovely, lovely essay written by a friend of mine who, who studies English poetry, and she writes about poets' first experience of poetry, and it's called, uh, I think it's called Being Called to Poetry. Uh -huh. And I would love to ask you, when did you first discern some call to art? How did that, how did that come about in your life? How, wh wh well, how did you just sense it coming? I'm often asked this about, you know, the origins of things, because, you know, being a, an artist is a rare thing. Now, my children used to say it's a very odd thing that our father's an artist, of all things. It's not a normal job. So people are always interested in origins. Where did this strange, anomalous thing about being an artist? It's partly because we don't know what an artist really is. And so I'm often asked how it happened first. And this, this story is out in the, in the system, you know. That it, it's the question of the first aesthetic experience. And my first aesthetic experience, I can remember, well, was linguistic, actually. It, we're in the west of Scotland here. I was brought up just west of here in, in a village called Eldersley, which is the birthplace of William Wallace, the national hero of the Scots. It was just across the road, actually, from the monument out there. And that monument was very early in my knowing. So I think that's a very important part of it as well. But in that street in the west of Scotland in the 1960s, where there is considerable sectarianism, you know, between Protestant and Catholics, I was outside the front door of the house and a boy called John Coulter came up to me, he lived up the road, and he said to me, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? And I didn't know. So I went in to my mother and I said to her, Mum, am I a Protestant or a Catholic? She said, you're a Protestant, dear. And this struck me as being an extremely disappointing answer because the sound of the word Protestant was desperate in comparison with the sound of the word Catholic. Catholic sounded sparkly, cosmic, ick. It sounded Roman because I knew the word Roman was involved in it. It sounded 
absolutely glamorous and charismatic. Whereas Protestants sounded horribly technical, trudging and quotidian. So I, I took my sword, because in those days I used to walk about armed to the teeth, and I took my sword <laughs> and went out to the front of the garden again. John Coulter was gone by this time. But I stood in the wall and held my sword up above my head and shouted, I am a Roman Catholic, to the street. <laughs> now, that strange antic was all to do with an aesthetic judgment. I didn't know what Catholic meant. I didn't know what Protestant meant, conceptually. All I knew was I didn't like the sound of one and I liked the sound of the other. So that was a purely formal, perceptual experience. And the start of being an artist is not at a conceptual level. It's all to do with surface effects. We are profoundly superficial people. We're just interested in the surface, the look of things. No glass of wine is never better than it tastes. No piece of music better than it sounds. No work of sculpture better than it looks. It's just as you see. And it's the seeing that's the thing. We're not interested in two milli milli millimetres under the surface of a thing. And we're certainly not interested in psychologicals underneath it either. We just want, if you want to do a portrait of somebody, make it a dead ringer and then you'll get the character coming out. Make it look like him and then the character will, be, will, will become clear because his own face has been modelled by his life experience and his own conduct to his fellow man and woman. Therefore, then you get the personality through. A man is as he looks. Except in, in exceptional cases, and we call, we call that evil. That's why at the beginning of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, you know, there's the beautiful wicked queen. You know, remember Disney's film? Mm -hmm. And she's far more terrifying than at the end when she transforms herself into an old witch. Because as an old witch, she bears the look of her nature on her. Whereas when she's at the beginning, she's so beautiful that this is very disturbing that somebody so evil and malevolent could look so beautiful. This is what evil is. Evil is the form, is badness hiding behind the form of the good. So this is what makes, for instance, so-called Nazi architecture so disturbing. Because it's so often extraordinarily beautiful. Yet we know that behind it lurks a dreadful regime, a, an outlook that is absolutely at atrocious, atrocious. You see, Hitler should really have built in his own image, which is what we are doing now. We are, you know, as you think, what's the ideal Hitler-like city? It would be something like Dubai or some ghastly, you know, high-rise dy dystopia. But he didn't, he didn't build in his own image. And that's the great problem. And why that happened, I think, has really... I think the architecture of the Third Reich is absolutely fundamental to the mystery of our total societal meltdown. That if it hadn't been for Adolf Hitler, we would still be building proper classical buildings. We'd still be teaching kids at art school how to model figures if it hadn't been for Adolf Hitler, because he toxified all that. I've got a very dear patron in America who has made his house into a cabinet of curiosities. It's a vast place with tremendous collections. And he, uh, he's, a, he's a man that doesn't like the state. Big, you know, he's against the big state. So, as a consequence of this, in a rather noble spirit of pathology, has collected things associated with the big state all his career. So, he has, for instance, in his garden, a collection of statues of toppled dictators that he's retrieved from these places that have been liberated. And uh, he has them, you know, he's got, he's got a Marshal Tito, a couple of Stalins, he's got a Lenin or two, he's got various... Paul Potts or whatever you've got, I don't know, these, you know, the, the Asiatic dictators. And, uh, 
and it's very interesting stuff. And he's also very keen on uh, the people that fought against the big state. So Eisenhower, you know, and Churchill. He's very keen on both of them. So he's got this marvellous little room where he has two paintings by Churchill, because Churchill was a very good painter, and two not bad paintings by Eisenhower. And he thought, there's a third. So he got two perfectly respectable amateur watercolours by Adolf Hitler. They're all in the one room, <laughs> right? <laughs> so this is three guys that really trucked with each other in the 20th century, who all happened to be painters. And he's got examples of them. Now, of course, there's an extrinsicality associated with viewing these things. You look at the Churchills and you think, gosh, that really is painting. And you think, and there it was, that manic depressive Churchill, you know. And he says, thank God that he, be, he, he was the prime minister. And then you think, there's Eisenhower, you know, two-time two, two, two president. But... Folk forget that because war trumps peace. So the guy that, you know, liberated Western Europe. And, you think, and they could paint quite well, not bad. And then you see these two wee watercolours and you think, world monster. <laughs> and they all had something to do with each other at a critical point. You know, and just think of it, April 1945, it all, bang, came together. So the thing is, it occurred to me when I was looking at the Adolf Hitler, one of them, uh, the other one's, I don't think it's signed, or it's signed in the back, that's what it is. But this this one has its signature, it just says, E Hitler. It's a little street scene, the most innocuous thing you'd ever see. See that street scene there, for instance, on that poster with the steeple? No, you're, I don't think you're seeing it. See where I'm pointing? If you look at my finger here, see where I'm pointing? Do you see oh, there's yeah, a street yeah. scene with a steeple, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's that kind of scene, but it's in Vienna. Um, and it's perfectly respectable little thing. I mean, if you'd drawn it, you'd be very pleased. You, you think of miles beyond your, your, your skills. And if it had slipped in its mount slightly, thus obscuring the inscription, the signature, then you just think, ah, oh, it's quite nice to be motorcar, it's a nice looking place, the figure's a bit weak. There would be no problem about it. Then you take it to the framers and you hoist it back up again and you say, A Hitler. And this, this extrinsicality, this extrinsic thing becomes intrinsic. So you can't like the picture. You can't like the picture. And that's the concept, Hitler, conveyed by the word over the percept, completely ordinary little street. That's the problem with conceptualism. It depends upon the word and things that are extrinsic. It, 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 we're certainly always going to bump into that, the, the cultural question of what happened in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that that it's the uh, single most important cultural event in the modern age was when was what happened there. It's what's given the go-ahead to the eradication of the forms of the West. I remember when I was at art school trying to make little figures in the sculpture department some toilet graffiti cropped up and it said, watch out, Poland, Sandy's coming. Just because I was making rubbishy little sub-Rodan kind of figures at the time, it was enough to say that if you model a figure, you're somehow fascist. You see, one of the great catastrophes was when you politicise art, well, we come back to the Nazi regime. And this is the arts, of course, you're finding the... Uh, the Hitler phenomenon extremely, extremely profitable, uh, you know, uh, extremely uh, useful, I might say. And my friend James McMillan, the composer, talks about having been at a music conference in the continent. It was something to do with the Darmstadt School. They were all cultural psychopaths, you know. And at one point, somebody played something, and it was the usual standard plink plonk you know, modernism, musical modernism. And at one point he played a C major chord and he was booed and shouted down, bullied afterwards and accused of denying the Holocaust because he played 
He wrote a C major chord in the middle. This is the sort of rubbish we're dealing with. So it seems to me that the, the Hitler phenomenon is the central one in the history of modern culture. Because what it did was it gave us the go-ahead to abandon Western forms of Western art. So that those folk that, uh, that simply will not allow students at architecture school to contemplate, far less design, a building with a classical profile. These, these children will be, they'll be failed in their exams so if they do this. So what's happening there is the tutors that fail them, that they absolutely clamp down, are really working according to a circumstance that could not have happened un except that Hitler was around. So you're saying it gave permission yes. to unleash a certain, a certain iconoclasm. A, a iconoclasm, above yeah. all, yeah. and a denial of all that had been going before, that nothing is sacred and the works of the past, by virtue of them being in the past, are now irrelevant. Have you heard of yarn bombing? Yarn bombing is when an artist will knit a hat on a big scale and then get permission usually to put it onto a 19th century statue out in the square. It's called yarn bombing. Yarn as in thread, I mean, wool. But the key word is bombing. It's a way to animate and make folk laugh at the statue. In Glasgow, they've got a traffic cone on top of the Duke of Wellington's statue, and it's become official. And the idea is that we're meant to laugh at that. And what's really happening there is that people are laughing now at the deadness of the statue. They're laughing at death. Well, Sculpture is particularly victimised because it refuses to move. That's why, for instance, the great popular art of the 20th century, the leftist century, you know, I mean leftism from Russia through Nazi Germany to fascist Italy to you know, liberal fascist contemporary culture, it, it's all movement and that's cinema. It's the, the movies. You see, the movies won. Well, imagine if I was asked, to appear alongside Matt Damon in the next series of these adventure films that he makes. Everybody would say, Sandy's really made it. He's now, you know, gone to Hollywood and he's doing it with Matt. Conversely, if Matt Damon decided that he'd come to Paisley to work with me for a while, they'd all say, what's wrong with Matt? Is something, some, has he got some great unhappiness? And the reason for that is that I would be going into the movies. So everybody would be applauding, but Matt would be coming into the stillies. And that's the realm of death. You see, we know that somebody's dead by one primary means, a complete absence of movement, okay? The minute their eye flickers a wee bit, we think, oh good, they're alive. The sculpture's never going to come to life in that way. It's the absolute embodiment of the state of being dead. And this is why coarse, life-loving, primitive peoples, barbarians basically, are so terrified of sculptures. And that's why they habitually smash them. It is literally an attempt to overcome death. It is a last that gasp to animate them in some way. They have no idea of the immobility of the statue. They're always trying to bring their statue to life. Whereas they don't understand the job of a statue is to be brought to stand stock still comfortably forever. That's why you don't have them smiling. Because a smiling statue in the middle of the night is quite a frightening thing, if you think about it. We smile to people. And the statue stands in complete isolation forever. It doesn't know we are there. Well, you know, there's pl plenty of paintings of Ro Robert E. Lee and they don't really want to pull them down. It tends to be the sculptures that get it. I suppose sculpture, of course, it, it consumes part of the space that we could be in if it weren't for it. So it's one of the biggest objections to sculpture is that it takes up space. And that means that we can't walk in the area where the statue stands. So this makes a certain kind of conquistador type very annoyed. And then the statue is also up there. Therefore, it can be torn down and it makes a bang when it hits the ground. So that's also very pleasing. 
And we just love to kick down a sandcastle, don't we? So it, it, this uh, iconoclasm appeals to a killer instinct in the mobs that howl for these things. The Taliban like to bomb the Buddhas of Bamayan. Do you remember that? Mm. And the reason they do this is because the Taliban is a very life-affirmative, vitalistic organisation. That's why young men are so attracted to it. Gun-toting. And they don't like the Buddhism of the statues, but they don't even possibly know that they're Buddhist. And it's really nothing to do with it being pre-Islamic or if it is, or non-Islamic. It's really ultimately to do with the fact that they're standing there still and bigger than them. The fundamental dichotomy is the, or is the war between art and nature. And nature is winning hand over fist. Now, when you say beauty, it's very important this. When you say beauty to an artist of, a, of an official type, you know, a, what you might call an establishment artist today, it's the kind of artist that's taught at an art school Right. You know the art schools today are in meltdown. And you say the word beauty, the tutors will often put a prophylactic smile onto their faces, extreme discomfort, and wish that the word beauty has not been, had not been said because we're in an art school here and we're not dealing with beauty. And you don't use language like that in an art school. That's in a contemporary art school. Yeah, the problem is that we don't really understand that beauty itself should, to be properly beautiful, be in fact quite ugly. The Venus de Milo in the Louvre in Paris, you know, the, the famous statue? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a paradigm of beauty, and people stand and look at it and marvel. If, however, they saw a girl walking down the road who had a face like that, they'd think, oh, that's a wee shame. What happened? Did the wind change? Because really, if you had a face like the face of the Venus de Milo, you would seriously get some work done. So what is it then that makes this so suitable and perennial a standard of beauty? And the truth is, Stephen, that beauty has something in it that repels you. And this is what our problem in the classical traditionalist world nowadays is to do with that they, so many of the schools of art that are running, private schools, they don't understand that to, a, a thing, if a thing is too beautiful, it, it, if it's beautiful to the point of view of attractive, then the whole purpose of art's disappeared. Art is there in the same function as they used to put bromide in the tea of soldiers to still their sexual questing. This is the purpose of art. It's a, art is, is there as an analgesic measure to tranquilize you. It's not there to stimulate you. It's there to put you to sleep. It's there, it's a function, a means that has come about to still our will to live. See, so what, what's happening there is that the artist is actually a purveyor of death, death of the will to live. And the, the more successful he is, the more he will do that. That's why Wagner, Richard Wagner, in my view, the greatest artist that ever walked the face of the earth, is so controversial. It's nothing to do with the anti-Semitism. That's just the surface excuse. The real reason is that Richard Wagner is a killer. He kills us dead. And he's the, the absolute sorcerer. He does this every time. The minute it starts, you just, ah. Oh, I have a terrible problem with it in, at concerts or opera, of falling asleep, literally. And... It's not because it's boring or anything. It's because it's so effective and I'm so susceptible to this lullaby. That's the thing. We sing our children to sleep, you know. I mean, we don't assemble flat pack furniture in front of them to put them to sleep. We sing them to sleep. Isn't that intriguing? And you know that in the old myth, Orpheus plays his lyre and sings and all the animals gather around, the lion with the lamb and the crocodile 
with the serpent. And they stop fighting with each other just to hear the music. It's just an old established idea that art sedates the rage of the world. And this is what makes modern art, I'm talking about 20th century art, so different from all the other kinds of arts that ever were. With the exception, I think, of the Aztec works of pre-Columbia, that, that traditionally art was always assumed to be what we'd call beautiful, right? Hold that. And it became synonymous with what beauty was. It just looks like that. And it, its beauty is in its gentleness, its kindness, its prettiness, its enchanting qualities, its buttermilk purity. And then the 20th century came along and it became all spiky, jaggy, cacophonous, ugly, even smelly. <laughs> An olfactory dimension came in. Mind you, the perfumes of the world haven't gone this way. That's one thing that's still beautiful. No, you, you know, um, Paco Rabanne has not introduced a, a scent called shite. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose in the olfactory field, culture is still traditional. Now, if, if, you, um, if you think about this, the, the 20th century had poems that were just chopped prose, right? The, the charm of the rhyme was really chased away, except by one or two uh, hardy survivors. Then melody was chased to the fence, except, of course, in Hollywood, where, and in the popular fields where it, it, it survived, pop music. In architecture, everything was just a dog's breakfast. Uh, and it was very, very confrontational in architecture. Modernism promoted the idea of piercing and jutting and um, punching, punching holes and walls, absolutely critically eschewing the idea of symmetry. So architecture through symmetry, which is its absolute stock and trade, out of the window in the 20th century, and painting just became a hash. Sculpture was the most predated upon, because anything could be sculpture now. In the modern art scene, contemporary art scene, painting is still recognisably painting. But one can fake an epileptic fit in the underground system of Stockholm and call oneself a sculptor. A sculpture seems to be the one idea where the greatest panoply of ballyhoo garbage has been dumped on it. And it's interesting why it should be sculpture that had to get that, because none of it looks like sculpture at all. But they wouldn't call it painting. You know, you don't get a degree for uh, photocopying A4 sheets of obscenities and putting it up in the wall. You don't get a, a degree at art school in the painting department for that. You always go to sculpture to do that sort of thing. So, um, so beauty has this quality in it that we associate with the stilling of the will, the gentle, the sweet, the kind. Charisma and char caritas are uh, two words that are related with each other. It's also to do with what the Greeks call ponos. That means hard wrought work, work that's very hard to do. So for that reason, we think of a beautiful, a bust of, say, the Beatrice that's in the Pitti Palazzo in Florence. Um, it's a beautiful 19th century marble bust. And you think, how hard is that to do? And the hardness of the doing of it, you know, the difficulty of making it is part of the beauty as well. Ponos, the Greeks called it, literally pain. So the sculptor has taken pains to do this. And that's an ex it's admittedly an extrinsic quality, but nevertheless, you can see how that taking pains manifests itself. So you might say that, that traditionally art is beautiful. If it's beautiful, it's painstaking, it's diligent, it's thoroughgoing, and it's not expressive of the character of the artist that made it. So compare and contrast with modern art. It's slapdash. I mean, Van Gogh paints a painting a day. <laughs> Picasso, four. Um, so it's <coughs> slapdash. It's um, highly expressive of the artist. In fact, it's called a Picasso. 
I can't even remember the name of the sculptor that made the Beatrice in the Palazzo Pitti in Florence. That tells you something, doesn't it? Mm. You think of the Statue of Liberty. You know, we know it came from France, but is the name of the sculptor a household name? You would have thought it would be. I don't actually don't know who, who sculpted it. You don't know who sculpted it. Do you know who sculpted Mount Rushmore? That's a wonderful point. Do you know who sculpted Mount Rushmore? No. Christ of the Andes? No. No. But do you know who sculpted the Angel of the North? I mean, you might not have heard of that. It's a big piece of modern art. But it's, everybody knows it's by Anthony Gormley. It should be called the Gormley of the North. It's in Middlesbrough, down in Newcastle area. It's beside a motorway. It's not an angel, of course. And it's not in the North, as far as we are concerned. <laughs> but anyway, so it's interesting, isn't it, that the Statue of Liberty, say, made by a man called Auguste Bartholdi, Frenchman, from Alsace. You'd have thought Bartholdi's name would be on everybody's lips, but it's not. Because the object itself is so beautiful, it obliterates the name of its maker. How could this be? Ever been made by somebody? Mount Rushmore, it has a certain beauty about it, notwithstanding Roosevelt's spectacles. <laughs> 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 but Gutzon Borglum that cut it, he, Senator Berry of South Dakota wanted, um, wanted Borglum to sign it. You know, a big signature <laughs> cut into the granite. And Borglum was really quite taken aback by the, the philistinism of that the, the suggestion. He said, what have my name got to do with this? This thing that will wear down the thickness of a child's finger since Moses was on earth. That's how he put it. So he understood that. He was an extremely obnoxious character, Borglum, and not a very great sculptor. But when he came to Mount Rushmore, something exceptional was done. There's no doubt about it. And I think Borglum himself knew that he had outstripped himself and was found weeping in, at the sight of it. Quite inconsolable at one point. And I think what happened was that he had stilled his own will with his own work. And it was more than he could, he could cope with. He's a very complicated character, Bor Borglum. Gutzon Borglum. Came of Mormon stock in Utah, Danish of origin, family. So and then we look at Christ of the Andes. It's the biggest Art Deco statue in the world. Nobody's heard of what's his name, Landowski, French Polish. So again, the same things happen. The the power of the work, the beauty, if it we call that beauty, its first victim is its maker. You know, kills Landowski dead. Nobody's ever heard of him. In the modern field, it, author, author is everything. You see, Jackson Pollock, the words Jackson Pollock, four syllables, are more meaningful to us, these four syllables, than any of his paintings is. Because we have a stronger notion of Jackson Pollock than we do of the, any, any, any single painting of Jackson Pollock. We know it's spillages and slaps. Quite interesting, actually, to look at. But... Um, so everything is to do with the being of the artist doing his thing. And in the contemporary art school scheme of things, all the students are encouraged in their work to express themselves. Their work should be about their identity. In my book, art should be about the obliteration of the identity of the pathetic artist. And thus we get, well, thank goodness, Mozart didn't express his identity in his music because, by all accounts, he was a rather silly man. The music, of course, not reflecting that, is the music despite Mozart. So we don't want to have self-expression in art. We want to have self-suppression. This thing that was destroyed astonishingly efficiently, they destroyed the West by Adolf Hitler single-handedly did it. I mean, he is... <laughs> the devil incarnate, you know, the more I hear about him, the more awful he seems to be. The, the current situation is going to bite its own tail because the more that the universities and schools make the children ignorant, right, as, as is happening, so we will start to forget about history and we'll forget quite who Adolf Hitler was because 
they just won't, they just won't remember because the amnesia that's been pumped into our veins by the, you know, the official educational establishment is such that eventually folk will think that Hitler's first name was Heil, right? They, they, they won't know that much. And then what will happen is that the toxification of the forms of the West will lift, you see? And then, hand in hand with that, modernism will be understood to be an interesting, if psychopathological, period style that happened in the age of ecological meltdown and was absolutely hand in hand with that ecological failure. There are, there are many people who want something more. More, yes. And, I'm noticing and, it as well. The kids that come to me, yes. I've got many refugees from the art schools coming. Do you? Oh, yes. And they come to me and they, they come secretly. They daren't tell their tutors. But I, I'm hopeful that the younger generation will be quick. I think they're getting fed up of the art schools. I've, I'm seeing a lot of young people who are fed up with the, the gruel they're being fed yes. under the pretense of it being culture, the spiritual bankruptcy, the emptiness of it. So I think the hunger is an index of a kind of awakening or at least a seeking of greater nourishment. What counsel do you offer to a young person mm -hmm. seeking to, to find their way with meaning and truth? be lovely if you, you wanted to share, for example, particular influences. You've mentioned uh, some of the artists that mm -hmm. you admire. What advice would I give them? Well, the first advice I'd give them is be under no illusions that what you're doing or proposing to do goes against the grain, the grain of nature, and that you're undertaking, if you're going to be a sculptor, a very dangerous path indeed that's liable to get you seriously bullied and punished. And that, that's the first thing I would say to them. Try to realize that it's so difficult. And why is it so difficult? It's because it's essentially transgre transgressional. Essentially transgressional, naturally transgressional. That you're, you're, you're going to engage upon a lifelong course of impertinence, nosy, and this is why also, you know, it's difficult in the sciences and all the arts, because what you're doing is prosecuting nature and, and writing, if you're a writer, a report on it, you know, or, or making a mugshot of it. If you're a visual artist, you're taking it prisoner, capturing it and putting it to sleep if you're a musical artist. So the arts are something that are rarely encountered, as I said earlier, my children always thought it was a strange thing that their dad was an artist. Uh, and it was because it's not common. And why is it not common? This is the interesting thing. Ask yourself, why is it not common? Nobody ever interviewed me, interviewed an accountant and said, if you're going to be an account, if a young person comes to you to be an accountant, how would you counsel them? This tells us something that, that it is an extraordinary, outlandish, proposal to encounter. Not, not because you don't make much money at it. Uh, it. It's because it's against nature's way. Now, um, I, I would also say to them, if you want to be a sculptor, <coughs> learn to sweep the floor. I mean that literally and metaphorically. Because you see, sculptors were always thought to be um, just a bit beneath the salt. You know what I mean by that? Um, they come from the wrong side of the tracks. We wear boots like this and we know how to work with our hands. So we've got a huge dose of what we call techne, right? Our whole lives are, are dedicated to making things with tools, pliers, everything. In the modern age, recently, there's been a trend where an artist prides himself on not making anything, but he has technicians or so-called collaborators to make it for them so that his hands are not sullied. The most famous example, the godfather of this atrocious tendency is a now deceased artist called Ian Hamilton Finlay, Scottish. He started as a concrete poet. Uh, and wasn't very good at that. And then 
he, he started to make objects, get objects made for him. Uh, uh, the story of Finlay is a monstrous one. And I worked for him for some years and I saw deeply into that ter tendency where one is an executant of another person's idea. This has become ordinary now. I mean, I, I have been accused of being by, by a, an arts mandarin, by a very fine maker, but not quite an artist. And the reason I'm not possibly, possibly not an artist is because I actually am a maker. If you're a maker, and they have categories, you have makers, then you have artists, and then you have gallerists, right? People that run galleries. So there's a difference between a maker and an artist. And an artist is somebody who sits in a prayerful mo uh, uh, posture, with his eyes shut, being pure mind, cerebral. It's, it's residual Platonism, but of the most pretentious and cack-handed sort. Cack-handed, get it? <clears throat> so, and then they're, they're, then they convey, by words always, to their little minions uh, down there what, what's to be made. And the little minion is to say, well, I don't know much about that, but right? uh, I know how to sharpen a chisel. Or I, I, you know, I'm, I'm your artisan type. I don't know what Mr. Finlay's really meaning, but I'll just make it anyway. And then, of course, it means that Finlay's uh, hands are unsullied. We get this all over the place. He's, he's... This is a this is a very this is a very deep point, actually, Sandy, because the advice you're giving, as it were, to an aspiring sculptor is, <clears throat> you know, to to sweep the floor, to get your hands dirty, mm -hmm. to be involved in, to learn about the yeah. making. Yeah. Um, would you would you uh, would you generalize that advice, as it were? Oh yes, for everybody. To, 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 as it were, to the non-artist as well. Uh -huh. me there's, yes, yes, absolutely. Can you say something about the? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, when I say sweep the floor, I really mean sweep the floor, literally, because you see, I've always found that people that come to work with me, students, you know, young people, you'll find that one or two of them won't sweep the floor. They simply won't sweep, literally, and that person's got no chance of being a sculptor at all, because they're not wanting to sweep indicates that they have pride. You see, because it's an old caste system thing, residual, perhaps. You know, it's only Dalits that sweep the floor. I am a Brahmin, right? And I found this, and the, 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 it's usually boys. The boys that won't sweep the floor are just hopeless, no use to man nor beast. So they, they won't become sculptors. So you have to lay down your pride. Then the next thing I would say is get a white coat on, a lab coat or a smock or something with which to hide your sartorial pride. Because your trousers and the shoes and jumper you wear are all, at some level, an expression of yourself. If you cover them over, then you, you're halfway towards a habit in the monastic sense, right? So you should get into the habit of the habit. And that's why the first thing I do when I come into the studio, you know, I take my jacket off. Because my jacket's made of tweed and it's telling the world something about me. Pretty decidedly, in fact, I think this is actually worsted, but anyway, it's, it's making a statement of my identity that he's a tweedy old curmudgeon, okay? So I've got to get rid of that. So I just put on the lab coat and suddenly I'm hidden away. So I would say to them, wear a smock. The young men are particularly poor at doing this. Then we don't want to have any radical haircuts or, I don't see, what should I say here, but, you know, other things on the body because again we want to make sure that it's a low-vis culture we don't wear colorful clothing these are just practical things and we don't have any pop music no jeans strictly i'm quite lax with that there is a place for denim of course but but not in a in a studio where where high culture is being pursued you're allowed to have the radio on but no pop music because it's stimulative so these are all hints that I would say to the young man or woman that wants to become a sculptor. Then you must also learn to be very cold for half the year. Uh, so we have a very seasonal approach. We're, we're working outside essentially for half the year because there's no heating in the studio. It's too big or you're too poor to have heating. So you've got to learn for, to embrace what I call the, the Bahamas of the soul. 
when we're lucky if it gets up to freezing, right? <laughs> so these are all practical things. Um, I would say that for when you look at the influences, don't look at Donatello. Look at Desiderio da Settignano. He was an artist of the most immense sensitivity and culture, whereas Donatello was his own man. Of course, you've heard of Donatello. You haven't heard of Desiderio. And that in itself is significant. The herd goes for that. Don't admire uh, um, Michelangelo for his sculpture so much as for his architecture. And go and look at the stairs of the, um, the library in Florence. The Laurentian Library, the most beautiful Mannerist staircase ever designed. That's Michelangelo at his most sublime. The Medici tombs in the chapel are superb as well, largely because of Michelangelo's highly developed and very cultured architectural sense. I would say to a young person, look at Giambologna. He's the, the pinnacle of Mannerism. Uh, ten times the sculptor Michelangelo ever was and just a sculptor. He sticks to it with no pretensions of divinity, no ghastly poetry written, uh, and, and no a tragic air. The most unplatonic artist you ever saw. Also for totality of design, second to none. Don't look at Rodin, the French sculptor. You look at him because it's easy to do. You learn to like Rodin, I'm speaking from my own experience, because you think you can manage that. Because it's rough, shoddy, distorted, and if you can't manage to model an arm, it doesn't matter, just cut it off. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, you know, it's truncationalism, right? So don't look at Rodin, look at Adolf von Hildebrandt, who died in 1922. He was as, just as famous as Rodin in his time, but modernism, decided that it was Rodin who was going to be brought forward and decided that Adolf and Hildebrandt should be, Hildebrandt should be put away to the side. You've never heard of him. You know, you've heard of Rodin. Have you? Of course. Yes. 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 I haven't heard of Hildebrandt, though. No. no. I don't know Hildebrandt. Uh, Hildebrandt, German sculptor, Munich, um, and in Italy. A great architectural designer as well. Uh, so of, of the two, look at Hildebrand, clever, clever artist. Uh, and again, modest. Unfortunately, his name was Adolf, so that didn't do him much help in the future. And also, many of his students actually went on to get big commissions from another Adolf that we don't like. So that was a problem. Uh, in terms of culture, go to Copenhagen uh, for taste and um, sensibility. And, and also for sculpture. It's the sculpture capital of the northern world, as far as I'm concerned, because it's got Torvaldsen's museum in it. And I think Torvaldsen was one of the very greatest, if not the greatest, of the modern sculptors. So I've followed him. I've followed Torvaldsen more than any other sculptor. He had a pupil called H.E. Freund, who is very, very important to take account of. Now, these are all obscure names that aren't, you know, properly given. In terms of modernism, by all means, look hard at it. I mean, I'm very interested in it. You know, as an oncologist is interested in cancer, so I'm interested in modernism. It's a fascinating field. For instance, it's not well known that the most famous Bauhaus building in the world was actually designed by a young man called uh, Ertl, Fritz Ertl. And... People don't know it's a Bauhaus building. He was a star pupil, Ertl, at the Bauhaus. This building, if I describe it to you, it's a sort of long, low wall with a tower there and a big opening there with two railway lines going towards it. You know, like that. You know the building I'm talking about? It's Auschwitz <coughs> concentration camp. It's a Bauhaus building designed by Fritz Ertl, star pupil of the Bauhaus. This is the kind of thing that is suppressed by the modernist authorities, our cultural commissars. We forget that the Bauhaus, for, just to continue on the Bauhaus, 
we forget that Arnold Schoenberg, a truly great composer, wrote to Kandinsky to complain that he'd done nothing to rip out the endemic anti-Semitism in the Bauhaus. Full of it. We forget that the Bauhaus was closed down by the Nazis, yeah, but it was closing down anyway because it was rubbish. It wasn't paying its way. German industry wasn't interested in, in, in uh, trucking with these maniacs with their happenings and their, their strange outfits and their sort of freak manners. They didn't want that. They've got perfectly good stuff going. It's Germany, for God's sake. They've got all they need. So the Bauhaus is an absolute fraud of, a, of an issue. And we must remember that Walter Gropius himself wrote letters back to his mother of the most coruscating anti-Semitism you've ever, ever heard. Yet he went on to rule the world. And of course, you know, these people are all oh, poor, poor, poor Gropius. He had to go to America. And poor uh, Mies van der Rohe. Mies was furious that Hitler wouldn't give him work. He was desperate to, to design the, the new Reichsbank. All he got was a couple of service stations and a motorway. <laughs> and of course, what he did was he went, went to America and pleaded persecution. He was just not sufficiently, uh, according to the taste of, 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 the, um, of the regime. So I would be very interested in modernism. Study it. This is because you're going to get critics that are going to hammer you and you've got to know more than they do. You've got to be cleverer than they do. You've got to be able to run rings around them. Also, re recite arguments to your, have arguments to yourself in the solitude of your studio. Imagine what your enemies are going to say about you and rehearse smart uh, retorts until you have them off pat. This will fortify your loins better than anything. It, it will, they won't love you for it, but it means that, that you will have defended yourself at least. So be look ahead. Look ahead to, to the, the, the confrontations of the future that are likely. And also learn to overlook. Don't be worried about rubbish. It is rubbish anyway. And then also don't be worried about the charlatan artists earning great deals of money, you know, you know, something, a piece of rubbish being sold for a quarter of a million pounds, you know, a banana, for instance, on the shelf, you know, and that, that gains somebody the Turner Prize. Don't be angry about that. And, you know, 25,000, is it? 20,000? I don't know. Don't be angry about that. Always, you should always remember that the rubbish contemporary artwork has to have a high price because it's got to gain its value somehow. And it does it by putting a number next to itself, <laughs> you see? So when, when you see a Jeff Koons being sold for another million plus, just say, well, oh, it's a shame. It's got to be, it's got to have the million attached to it. It's a shame for it. If only it could come off that incubation, that incubator or that life support system and just be free. What I'm wanting in my work is the return for silence, no words, no movement, no colour, just a, a lovely big feeling of sleep. And that's what makes classical art, and in particular neoclassical art, which is what I am really at, at heart, the greatest honour of my life was to be made a fellow of the Dalai Lama Centre for Compassion in Oxford. And the person that asked me to become an ordinary fellow, really, uh, with that, said that it was as, as a, uh, on account of the quality of peace and serenity that, that is to be found in your work, that they wanted me to do this, to become part, you know, associated with them. And that was marvellous that such an authority as a proper practicing Buddhist, uh, should notice that. My great hero, Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, is buried in Frankfurt, where he lived the latter part of his life. And his stone, which I've never gone to visit, his stone lies in a beautiful little cemetery, flat in its back. You know, it's been like that always. 
and it has simply the word Schopenhauer written on it. And there's a marvellous photograph of a saffron-clad Buddhist monk laying flowers on the stone of the Sage of Frankfurt. I wish I had a bouquet that I could lay at the feet of many of your sculptures here in this studio. I know that many people who pass, I'm certain that many people who pass your wonderful works, the world around, similarly pay homage in their hearts to what you have given them there in those works. You've been listening to the Ralston College podcast. I'm Stephen Blackwood. Today's guest was the great sculptor Alexander Stoddart. You can see Sandy's sculptures in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Princeton, Oxford, and Buckingham Palace. There's also some great videos of Sandy online. We always love to hear from you, our listeners, so please feel free to leave us a review or to send us a note. You can also join our efforts to renew, reform, and reimagine higher education at www.ralston.ac. I'm Stephen Blackwood. Till next time.